Good morning. Thank you for joining us online. Right out of the gate, we recognize a few things that need to be addressed. First, we know that this is abnormal for some. There are likely three groups of viewers who will be joining us here this morning. The first group is obvious. Those are the people who regularly attend services at Island Baptist. To that group, welcome. We miss you. I'm glad that you've joined us online this morning. The second group of people are likely those who've never been to a service here at Island Baptist. Welcome to you as well. We're glad that you're here. The third group of people are likely those who are joining us here online because they're frightened by the things that are happening around the world. I'd like to offer a very special welcome to that third group. And I'd like to encourage you to stay with this service all the way through to the end. I'm fairly certain that you'll be glad you did. The second thing we recognize is that for those of you who regularly attend a church somewhere, this might feel awkward to do church online like this. And I must say, it's good if you feel that way. The reason I say it's good that you might feel that this is awkward to have me talking to you through a camera is because in the Bible, the people of God are commanded not to neglect meeting with one another in person. It's very important to God that his people do life together that we make eye contact with one another and can see one another to encourage one another because life is hard and we were not designed to do it isolated. And so, while this may be a little awkward and abnormal for you, I want to thank God that we have tools like technology where even though this is not ideal, it can still allow us to function together and to meet together until things return to some semblance of normalcy. With that in mind, I want to encourage you with a few more things. Number one, some questions have come up regarding giving financially to the church. We hope that you will continue to give to the Lord as He has prospered you. So if you're out of work right now, we understand that. We understand that this is a unique time. If you are able to continue giving, we still have work to do. The gospel still needs to be preached to the ends of the earth. And we're relying on you to continue giving as God enables you to do so. You can do that via our website. You can give online. You can set it up by visiting www.hopeoflbi.com. And you can click on the link there that says giving. Or you can send in a check to our physical address here at 215 3rd Street in Beach Haven. The last thing I'd like to address to you is simply this, and I really hope you'll hear me. I think it could be very easy to look at a worship service like this and think of yourself as a watcher rather than a participant. So my strong encouragement to you is that you set this time aside as sacred time, just as you do on a Sunday morning. I suggest that you remove distractions from your living room or from your bedroom or your kitchen or your, wherever it is that you're watching this, your den, your office. Set aside as many distractions as you possibly can so that this will be a time of worship. This is really no different than a Sunday morning. Here's what I hope. I hope that as you worship here with us and Dave comes to play songs, you'll worship in your living room. That it won't be you watching on a screen, but that you'll actually sing and worship the Lord just as you would if we were all together. And if that happens, then all of our voices will come together 
And they will come up to the Lord as a fragrant offering to Him, as one unified people of God, worshiping in our separate households. Just as we would as if we were here. I'm confident that you'll take this exhortation seriously and you'll set aside this time, Sunday mornings, as long as this continues this way, as sacred time. Would you join me now as we pray, not only for our nation, but for our church and our communities? Let's bow together, right where you are, in your living room or your house. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus with a heart full of trust and adoration for God Almighty, the only one who can do anything about our situation, the only one who can save us. I come to you on behalf of your people, asking that you would cure our nation, not of the pestilence that's making its way through not only the U.S., but the world, but that you would cure us of the deadly soul disease of sin that has been killing mankind since the fall. I pray that you would use this current situation in our world to bring people to Jesus Christ, the great physician and savior of our souls. And I pray, dear God, now for our president and our leaders, that you would give them wisdom that comes from your very mind so that they would know not only how to lead our people back to a place of health, but also how to lead our people back to God. I pray that we would become a praying people, a people who return to church, a people who takes God and the Bible seriously. Lord, let this be done, not only for your glory, but for our joy. In the name of Jesus, the name which is above every other name, I pray. Amen. We as a church have been making our way through a sermon series through the two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, First and Second Timothy. But we decided to take a hiatus from that sermon series in order to address the growing angst that's been spreading not only throughout our country and our world, but in large part through the church. As a pastor, I'm far more concerned when the people of God seem to be shaken than I am when the various people of the nations of the world seem to be shaken. Here's why I say that. The early church, the apostles and those that followed them, they suffered and were persecuted and had far more reason to fear than any other time in the church's history. And yet, here's what the apostles wrote to those people who were likely full of fear. Listen to what they wrote. Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us be filled with gratitude and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So when the people of the kingdom of God suddenly start to lose their footing because a tremor has hit the earth. Yes, it concerns me. And it concerns other pastors. We, people, feel shaken whenever it is that the thing that has captivated us becomes shaken. Do you follow? Whatever it is, that captivates a person, will offer that person some semblance of security. So when that 
thing, whatever it is, gets shaken, the person who's put their hope in that thing will also be shaken. So let this be a time of self-diagnosis for the people of God. If you're shaken, ask why. Do some soul searching. Again, in Hebrews 12, look at the verse just prior to the one I read you. The 27th verse. Take a look. All of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. For the next few weeks, as we take a hiatus from our series through First and Second Timothy, my hope is to reposition the people of God, not just Island Baptist Church, but whoever would feel led to tune in on a weekly basis. My hope is to reposition all of us people under the shelter of the shadow of the Almighty. My hope is that when we do that for a couple of weeks, we will begin as a people to shift our focus off of shakeable things. And on to the promises and person of God. I want to show the world, as I hope you do too, what it looks like when a people hide themselves in Him. Before we do any of that, I'd like to ask you to pray with me right now, wherever you are. Would you bow your heads? Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, asking on behalf of your people that you would fill our minds with your word. Help it not only to come in now as I deliver this message, but help it to come back to your people all throughout the week and then maybe into the weeks that follow and for however long this crisis might continue in our world. What we need now more than anything, Father, is your word to do combat with the lies that continue to come in at us from so many resources. It's it's really uncountable. Father, we need you. So I pray that you would open the hearts and minds of your people to receive your word here this morning, wherever they may be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's read our passage for... For this morning together, it's going to be found in Psalm 91. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, you can turn there with me now, Psalm 91. It'll be displayed on your screen if you'd prefer to read it there. Here's what it says. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, The Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up. Lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, 
I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, we don't know exactly who it was that wrote this psalm. Some say it was Moses because Moses wrote the psalm prior. Others give the praise of this psalm to David. Whoever it was, this psalm is ours. This psalm is to be understood and accepted and lived out by all of the redeemed people of God until he is finished with his work here on the earth and gathers the very last one unto himself. This psalm is yours and it's mine. However, the main point of the psalm comes leaping off the page in the first verse. I hope you caught it. Take a look at it before I show you something very critical to whoever would claim these promises as their own. Take a look at that first verse. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, here's what I want you to do, if you can, from home. Try to capture that phrase, the Almighty, in your mind. Hold on to it and think about it for a moment. I've circled it for you there on the screen. What you can't see there in that English translation, the Almighty, is the power of the Hebrew word that it comes from. If we were to replace the English translation, the Almighty, with the Hebrew Here's how it would read. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of Shaddai. The name given to the one true and almighty God who controls not only the whole universe, but controls your life and part in that universe. The name given to him in this passage and many others, is Shaddai. Now that phrase appears 48 times in the Bible as simply Shaddai, and only seven times as the more commonly known El Shaddai. Seven times as El Shaddai, 48 times simply as Shaddai. Which is why I've entitled this special message, In the Shadow of Of Shaddai. I think the big idea is probably obvious to you by now. But in case it's not. Here's what I've given it. Those who live in the shadow of Shaddai. Find peace. In the midst of the storm. There are several promises here in this psalm. That I'd like to point your attention to. But before I do. There's something really critical that you need to know. Not all promises are alike in the Bible. Some promises are conditional and others are unconditional. An example of an unconditional promise would simply be this. Jesus Christ has promised to return again at some undisclosed date in the future. That's going to happen whether we're ready or not. It's a day on God's calendar. It's unconditional. Other promises in the Bible are conditional. Whenever you find a promise in the Bible where you see the word if there, not always, but many times you know that's going to be a conditional promise. Whether it's written with an if or not. Let me give you two examples. One from the Old Testament and then a promise from the New Testament. The first example comes from the prophet Isaiah. In the 26th chapter. You may know this conditional promise. Take a look. You will keep him. In perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on you. So the promise there from God. Is that he will keep you in perfect peace. But there's a condition. The condition is that. You must keep your mind. Fixed on him. And his word, and not on the news. Do you see the condition there? If you keep your mind 
fixed and stayed on me, then I will keep that person, whoever it is. I hope it's you. I will keep you in perfect peace. So if you feel like you're lacking peace right now and anxiety is setting in, may I ask you, are you applying this conditional promise? There's another conditional promise in the New Testament. Very common one. 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So God's promise to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all the effects of your sins are contingent upon, according to this verse, your willingness to confess your sins. So do you see? There are conditional and unconditional promises in the New Testament. The reason I went through all that is because this famous psalm that people love to talk about whenever a crisis comes about is a conditional promise of Shaddai, the Almighty, to people who would put their trust in Him. There are three simple truths that the whole world needs to hear this morning about God's promise to shelter His people when storms like the ones we're enduring right now begin to come. For the sake of time, we're not going to look at every single verse in this psalm. But for those of you who have been experiencing even the slightest little bit of anxiety over the past few weeks, my guess is that anxiety will probably continue to grow. I've decided to take a hiatus from our current sermon series for you. I'm doing this specifically for people who are struggling with anxiety right now, even if it's small. This psalm is the antidote you've been looking for. You're not going to find it anywhere else. And so I'm begging you, Not only to take this message in, to stick with me through the end, not only to take it seriously, but to share it with someone, to send it to people who you know are struggling, even those people who are acting as though they're not. Let's go through this one at a time, one step at a time. Three truths I want to reveal to you, beginning with our first truth. Number one, Shaddai is your hiding place. Here's what I want to say. Here's what this verse is going to show us, these passages. You, me, no one else in the world, not the president, not the pope, no pastor, nobody, will ever find the safety and security we're looking for anywhere else but in God. Look back at verses 1 through 4. I want to show you this. Verse 1 says, He who dwells. Can you stop right there? It's talking about you. Put your name there. Luke or John or Bill or Bob or Harry or whatever your name is. The person who dwells, not comes to visit, not comes to church once in a while, not does a morning devotional time, not confesses Jesus as their Savior. He dwells. Who dwells. Keep reading. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Stop right there. In these times when this was written. The shadow was often used as a metaphor. For people who certainly understood what it was like to work outside in the hot sun. That would beat down on them all day. Sometimes it was dangerous to work out in the sun for that long for these people. So they would know the shadow was used as a, meta- as a metaphor for a place of safety, protection, and comfort from the oppression of the sun. Let that sink in as you read this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress My God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the deadly snare of the fowler. And from the deadly pestilence or disease. He will cover you with his pinions or some translations say feathers. 
and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. What I'd like you to do, just as I did a little while ago, I'd like to draw your attention to one word there. The word is shelter. I want to focus there for a bit. In the Hebrew, the word for shelter is sether. Sether. Which literally means a hiding place. In fact, a few psalms earlier, in Psalm chapter 32, it's translated as hiding place. The same word that you see here for shelter is translated elsewhere as hiding place. Take a look. You are my hiding place, Sather. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance, Selah. I'd like you to think back to when you were young, if you're not young anymore. Remember when you were scared, perhaps at nighttime. What would you do? Many people run and hide under mom's bed. Others would pull the covers over their head. Some would run to an older brother or an older sister and hide in their bed. Some would hide in their closet. Others didn't have any place to hide in their home. Wherever that place is, it only offered you a fraction of a second of peace of mind. Sooner or later, all those fears that got you to hide in the first place, they would return. Where are the majority of people hiding today? Where are the majority of people that you know seeking to hide from the storm that's come upon us? Where might you be trying to hide? Wherever it is, I can assure you of one thing. It isn't going to offer you the peace that you're really after. Only God can satisfy that longing for security and peace sanctuary that your soul is craving. Here's why. At the mention of his name, darkness runs and hides. Even death, even death has no victory over people who are sheltered in the safety of God. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In the New Testament, there were a group of Christians, a small group of believers, who were scared. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote to these believers. In Colossians 3.3, 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, before you focus on that last part, I want to draw your attention to the first thing that Paul said to them. For you have died. You have died. You have died. Here's why this is so significant, especially in a time like the one that we're dealing with now. What may I ask? can possibly be taken away from a person who's died. Nothing. To have died with Christ means that you were crucified with him, that you were risen with him three days later, and that now you are hidden with Christ in the protective hand of God, and no one can pluck you out. It is the safest lockbox that a human being could possibly put their soul into. That's what this psalm is trying to convey to you. The time has come for believers to move out of a theoretical acknowledgement of this core truth and to live it out as their core reality. Building a life around this principle, listen closely to me here, wherever you may be. Building a life around this core principle 
is the only path to an absolutely rock solid and certain unshakable foundation. Regardless of what other earthquakes may be on the horizon. For our nation, for the world, and for your church. When a person hides themselves in the perfectly secure shelter and shadow of the Son of God, what could possibly take you out of that shelter? If you look back at the kind of language that's used in verse 4 of Psalm 91, it will only further emphasize the point that God continues to make to His people. Look back at verse 4. In the very first part of that verse, it says, He, God, will cover you with His pinions, or some say feathers. Under His wings you will find refuge. Do you understand the kind of metaphor that's being used here? It's a metaphor that's used all throughout the Bible in both Old and New Testaments. As a matter of fact, even Jesus used the same metaphor of a mother bird who longs for her children or her young birds to come to him. But before Jesus used it, do you know who else used it? Moses did. He used it to help the people of God who were riddled with fear to understand the way that God thinks about his children. Listen to how Moses spoke to the fearful people of God. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 11. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. Are you picturing this? He, God, spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Think of a young eagle. Maybe in the nest. It's just learning how to fly. When that young eagle goes out to fly, often they get tired. And when they do, they'll begin to fall. As the young eagle begins to fall, the mother eagle spreads out her wings so that the small eagle who's falling can land safely and secure on the wings of their parent. Christian, listen to me. This metaphor is Scripture passed down from generation to generation to the people of God. And now it's coming to you because God longs for you to feel like that small bird to learn to fly on his wings throughout all the days of your life. That's why this is in your Bible. That's why Moses gave it to his people. That's why David or whoever wrote this psalm, maybe it was Moses, is giving it to you now. That's why Jesus gave it to the people of Jerusalem. Shaddai carries his children and will not let them fall to destruction. He trains his people to learn to ride out the days of their life on his wings. What a beautiful picture of God's care for His children. Wouldn't you agree? The threats that are facing the United States and the people of the world are real. And they're to be taken as real and serious. They're as real as any of the other threats that the people of God have faced in times gone by. But here's what you need to know. The people of the world, in times like these, they hide themselves in all kinds of things that can't save them. As a matter of fact, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, in the sixth chapter, tells of what will happen at the very end. It says that the leaders of the world, kings and all the rulers of the world, along with rich people and poor people and everyone in between, will seek to hide themselves from the fearful things that are coming upon the world in caves. That's what it says. You can look it up for yourself. Revelation chapter 6. All the people of the world will hide themselves in caves from fear of Shaddai, the Almighty. 
The same thing is happening on a much smaller scale right now. Your cave is whatever source you go to to hide yourself and to feel secure. Whatever that may be, I can assure you, it's not going to work. If your cave is a 401 cave or a cave of your company or the cave of a paycheck, all of those will eventually fail you. Even if your cave is the safety and security and the hiding place of your family, that too will eventually fail you. God alone, El Shaddai, is the only suitable hiding place for your soul. It is the only safe and secure place that will give you what you're after. Most people that I know seem to be able to keep some semblance of composure through times like these. That is until something seems to threaten their home. My friend, who is an attorney in Manhattan and who lives in Hoboken, He helps people whose homes are threatened by foreclosure. And he would be the first to tell you that people are often able to keep their composure until someone threatens to take away their home. And he calls me telling me all the time, that's when people lose their composure. That's when people start to act in a way they otherwise wouldn't. It's interesting that the psalmist starts to address this very thing in the next part of the passage. The second truth that God wants you to know from Psalm 91 is this. Truth number two, Shaddai is your true home. Here's what you're going to learn. You cannot find the genuine sanctuary. Think about that word. You cannot find the genuine sanctuary we all crave in any other place but in God. Look back at verses 5 through 10. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. So as before... Let me narrow your focus. I know that's a lot of verses. Let me narrow your focus to a single phrase there. I'm quite certain that this single phrase captures the essence of the psalmist's main point in this second part of the passage. The phrase is found in verse 9 where it says, Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Hebrew word for dwelling or dwelling place is maon. And its meaning is a personal habitation or as the English speaking world would translate it, your home. This is very different than the last verse where God is called your hiding place. So it's not hiding place, it's your home. I want you to try wherever you are to try to think of what the difference. God is my hiding place, but now God is often my home. The psalmist is trying to say that God is the true and only abode for those who belong to him. For many of us, I want you to think of what comes to mind when you think of your home. Think about when you've had a long day at work. What ideas start to come to mind when you're thinking about the idea of your home? For many of us, home is simply a synonym for sanctuary or place where I can let my hair down. Not for everyone, but
but for many of us. It's where peace is found at the end of the hard day. And it's where you can feel at ease and at rest. Most Christians, I hope you'll hear this very clearly. Most Christians acknowledge that God is their home and that Christ is their source of peace. But very few take it from that simple affirmation of a doctrinal statement to boots on the ground kind of action. Very few are able to take this knowledge that, yes, God is my home and make practical use of this. Now, Christian, now, church, now is the time when this must move from theoretical knowledge to a pillar of your life. Otherwise, here's what's going to happen. You're going to try to make your temporary home your home. You're going to try to make this country your home. You're going to try to make this world your home. And it is not. And when you try to make this place your home, this temporary place, and when that temporary place starts to fade away or something threatens it, let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to start to lose your composure. That is, unless you make this practical. And God really, truly does become your home. And when he does, what can anyone take from you? Nothing. Let me tell you something that is very rarely, if ever, brought up in Christian conversations. At least the ones that I've had. You have never, ever experienced home. Not even for a moment. Even though you might think you have, you haven't. Some people even describe the sensation of not feeling at home in their own skin. And do you know why people have this feeling? It's because you are a being. I don't care who you are. I don't care what background you're from. I don't, it doesn't really matter. If you're a human being, You were made for permanent oneness, inseparability with God. And as long as you are here in this fallen world and in this fallen body, there will always be some degree of homesickness for everyone on the planet. Some less to a small degree and some to a great degree where they never feel even the remote sensibility of contentment because they long to be home. I'm kind of on this further end of the scale. Where are you? Paul said this about all born-again people in Philippians 3. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. So as long as your body is absent from the Lord, you will feel a sense of homesickness until your body, mind, soul, and spirit are all unified together with God. You're not home. Listen to how Paul even put his own personal preference of where he preferred to be. Listen to how he put it. 2 Corinthians 5.8 We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Listen to me, Christian. To be here on this planet, whether you're living in a time of great prosperity United States, like in the 1980s, or we're living in a time now where most of the world is full of fear. Wherever, whenever time you live in, if you're here, you are away from home. And as long as you're away from home, you will never feel the kind of contentment and security that you're promised to feel one day. Heaven. Heaven. I want to ask you if you could to just try to imagine for a moment what it will be like to be in paradise one day. Can you do that with me for a few moments? Heaven will be a place of permanent, unending, unceasing 
painlessness, perfect peace. Not one single moment of sin, sinful thought, sinful feelings, no anger or jealousy, not even a thought. How eager are you for that kind of a place in a day like the one we're living? Perfect peace can only be found when you're exactly where you were designed to be, which is with God. So those, listen very closely to me, those who try to make this home as close to heaven as they possibly can, listen to me, you will always, always be dissatisfied because you weren't designed to live here. You were designed to live there. And you're only here as a temporary sojourner. So take my word for it. Take God's word for it. Don't try to make this place your home because it simply isn't. I haven't heard anyone, anybody put it as simply and succinctly as C.S. Lewis. And while I've shared this numerous times with my church, perhaps you may have never heard this before. C.S. Lewis put it like this. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Isn't that simple? Well, maybe not to you. You might be thinking, so what, Pastor Luke? So what, C.S. Lewis? I don't live there now. I live here. So you might be saying in your living room, Snap back to reality. That's great that one day I'll be out of peace, but for now, I live here. What kind of mantra can you offer me to get through the times we're in now? Well, I want to give you something. I want to give you three cries of heaven's citizens who are forced and have the privilege to sojourn here now. Of being about the business of God until we're called home. These are the three cries of great men and women of God of days gone by. Here they are. Because he is my home, I am never homeless. Because he is my home, I refuse to settle in anywhere else. Because he is my home. I am not afraid to die. People who make statements like these, their mantra, their battle cries, they respond differently than the rest of the world. People who make statements like these, their daily pillars upon which they live their lives. You know what happens to them? They become leaders when the rest of the world doesn't know what to do. You know why? It's because their hope is anchored to something outside this world. That just so happens to be the way this psalmist concludes the psalm. Take a look at our third and final truth. Truth number three, Shaddai is your only hope. Here's what you're going to learn. You cannot find the hope of salvation that you're searching for, that all the world is searching for anywhere else but in God. Look back at verses 14 through 16 and you'll see it. Before you look there, there's a shift that happens in this psalm in the way that it's read. Up until now, we've been reading it from the perspective of the psalmist, whoever wrote it. But now, what you're going to read shifts perspectives, and we're going to be reading from the perspective of God speaking to his people. So I'm going to invite you, read this last portion of the psalm as if God is speaking directly to you and your name. I'll prompt you to replace your name when the time comes. Are you ready? Beginning with verse 14. Because he, insert your name there, Because he holds fast to me in love, 
I will deliver him. I will protect him. Insert your name there. Because he knows my name. And when he, insert your name there, calls to me, God Almighty, I will answer him. I will be with him, insert your name there, in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him, insert your name there. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Whoever you are, wherever you are, the whole world is looking for salvation right now. That's why we fear, because we're looking for someone to help and rescue us. Just three days ago, I received a text message from my friend who lives in the city, and here's what he said, and I quote, So many people around here have lost their jobs, and the majority have lost all I don't mean to sound brash in saying this. But what kind of a response should we expect when people put their hope in things that can be shaken? Things like money and the things money can buy. Even food and shelter. Hopelessness begins to happen. When the object of your greatest desire begins to go away. Did you hear what I said? Hopelessness begins to settle in. Whenever the object of your desire, your greatest desire, begins to go away. And so, if God is truly your hope, then when the things of the world begin to fall away, one by one, it won't face you. At least as much as the rest of the world. In his closing remarks, the author of Hebrews reminds believers not to fall in love with money or the things that money can buy. Even the essential things that money can buy. The author of Hebrews is warning people, don't Put your trust in or fall in love with the things that money can offer you. The reason that people fall in love with money is because they think it will buy them the power to stay safe should a catastrophe strike. And let me tell you, as we're all learning, it simply doesn't work. So to help them feel safe, the writer of Hebrews offers them this final promise from God. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Here's why. Because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Notice what he did there. God points them back to himself as the source of hope. Why? Because money and the hope it offers will always, always, always be shaky and flimsy. Do you see that there? If the love of this world, that may even be a fine job, a good lifestyle, it may even be the love and desire for a healthy life. If that has overtaken you, then when those things start to be taken away from you, so too will the foundation of your hope. Do you see? But if your hope is in God, if your hope is truly in God, then you will never be like one of the people whom my friend is texting me, telling me is happening all over the city. You'll never be a person who says, I'm losing hope. Look again at the very last phrase of this psalm in verse 16. It says, I will satisfy him, insert your name there, and show him my salvation. Whenever a person has come to be satisfied in him and his promise of eternal life, 
it frees that person to let go of this life. The Apostle John put it like this. 1 John 2, 25. And this is the promise that he made to us. Eternal life. So many people believe that Jesus died for them and that heaven is their home. But so many of those same people live out their lives with perpetual doubt that heaven really is a superior pleasure to the pleasures to be had in this life. And so they live out their days with perpetual doubt, clinging instead to the insubordinate pleasures and comforts of this world. It was John Piper who said this, I don't so much pray that my death will be without pain, but that it will be without doubt. This psalm, Psalm 91, is here to equip God's redeemed people to wage war against doubt as it begins to creep up in your soul. This psalm is here to remind you of these three truths that we've been focusing on. Here they are again. Shaddai is our secret hiding place. Shaddai is our true home. Shaddai is most certainly our only hope of salvation. More than anything else, in these times of uncertainty, what I'm convinced that the people of God need is childlike faith. And so to help us to really grip on to childlike faith, those of us who may have lost it, I've invited a very special guest to close our service. It's my daughter, Peyton. And she's going to play a song for you that's one of her favorite songs. That song is going to help you to really lay hold of that simple truth that He will hold you fast. Let me pray for you before she comes. Father, I pray for everybody who may be watching this that you would help them not, to, not, not just to believe these truths, but to cling to them for their very hope. That these truths would sink in and that they would be able to not only use them in a time of desperation, but pass them on to the world, to their next door neighbor who may be riddled with fear. God, I thank you for this psalm. I thank you for your word. And I pray that you would be that help for us that we so desperately need in a time of trouble. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.